Welcome to Eco Community Conversations, made possible by Earth Gives, a 501c3 nonprofit organization working to catalyze environmental philanthropy on behalf of our, our Earth. Today, environmental giving sits at just 2% of all giving. And so we're working to expand on that and uh, put out the welcome mat to the donor to invest in organizations like our guests here today. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about it. So we're kicking off this series. I'm Rhonda Bannard. I'm the executive director and founder of Earth Gives. And what we're working on doing right now is scaling Earth Gives Day and inviting uh, nonprofits across the country to join us on this platform and then invite the potential donors to discover, explore, learn about, get involved with, um, and support all these organizations across the United States. So joining me today is Nora Cullinan. Why don't you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and uh, where you're coming in from, and then we'll jump in and learn more about your organization in just a minute. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Nora, and I am the director of Major Gifts at Greenbelt Alliance. So we're an environmental nonprofit based in San Francisco. Um, I've worked for environmental nonprofits uh, my entire career, over a decade. So um, I'm born and raised in the Bay Area. So I have a lot of dedication and passion for the work we do here locally. Um, and Greenbelt Alliance has been around for over 60 years. Um, so we have a long legacy here in the Bay Area. So it's, it's great to be a part of this organization. That's fantastic. So in that work, what one piece of wisdom or that you might have or advice for anyone who's saying, you know, I really want to get involved in this issue, but I don't even know where to start. What would you suggest they do? Yeah, I think um, it's really important to understand that uh, it's not just, you know, this fun, loving environmental movement to protect our environment, but it's literally the future of humankind and our existence on planet Earth is under threat. Um, so I think it's very important to involve people from all socioeconomic and racial backgrounds, um, especially those in low income communities of color who are particularly vulnerable to climate impacts and have traditionally been left out of the planning solutions and investment conversations that directly affect them. Um, and for a long time, even to this day, you know, the environmental movement has sort of been seen as this liberal white led movement, um, but research actually show that people of color in the US, including Hispanic, African American, um, and non white groups are actually more concerned uh, than whites about climate change and in fact it's these communities that are often hit hardest by climate hazards. And so I think if we really want to have an impact on climate change, we need to involve everyone in the conversation and understand that environmental justice is not just about protecting open spaces and in natural lands, but uh, also about the land use decisions and guiding how communities are built and rebuilt um, that creates more equitable neighborhoods and creates housing and jobs established uh, by and for people of color. So how we build our communities is also a part of the solution. And I think it's a big uh, mind shift on what climate just justice means. And I think that'll be important for uh, change to actually happen. Thank you for that really important framing. That's so important and critical. So share a little bit about you and your story. Like, how did you get into this work? What brought you into Greenbelt Alliance or something that you might have worked in before? Yeah, I've so I've always worked in the environmental nonprofit sector and um, the missions have always really focused on protecting land, animals. I worked at WWF. Uh, I worked for Save the Redwoods League. So it was a lot of land acquisition. Um, so, but Greenbelt Alliance is, is really the first environmental nonprofit that I've worked for that also focuses on housing and land use planning as a solution to climate change. Um, so for example, uh, we want to use, we want to ensure that people have access to affordable housing and that they live within city centers close to their jobs and close to transit. 
uh, in the Bay Area, I'm sure as you know, many people, you know, they've moved to the outskirts of the region because they're getting priced out of their homes or rents are increasing astronomically. And so this means that more people are spending time in their cars, commuting to their jobs, and more greenhouse gas emissions are polluting the air. Um, and 33% of the Bay Area's greenhouse gas emissions actually come from our transportation. Uh, so infill housing built in urban areas near transit and jobs significantly reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions and I think is just really important part um, of the solution. And then share with us a bit about your organization. Um, you know, you said it's been around for 60 years. Tell us a little bit about its journey and and a little bit more about what it does. Mm -hmm. Uh, so our Green Belt Alliance's mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the region's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. Um, and we leverage our expertise in land use policy, advocacy, and regional collaboration uh, to realize a climate resilient Bay Area. Um, and to us, this looks like communities and people thriving in the places that they work, uh, live and play. Uh, it means staying safe during climate disasters, uh, suffering less and recovering quickly after the next wildfire, wildfire flood or drought. Um, and this is all thanks to solutions drawing on the powerful role of nature and nature-based solutions. Um, and we basically, we use land use policy to make lasting change. Um, and this is what's critical to reducing wildfire, drought, and flooding risks and protecting people and ecosystems for generations to come. What would be possible if there was more support for your organization, more investment, more knowledge, more understanding, um, mm -hmm. more volunteers? What, what would be possible? What could you do with that? Yeah, so um, like I said, we're an advocacy organization. So with support, we have the ability to work with communities to implement policies and on the ground solutions to climate, the climate crisis. So with more support and investment, we could implement policies that say, protect and steward our green belts or open spaces uh, and agricultural lands. And these spaces really serve as buffers to protecting communities from climate hazards like wildfire. Um, we can also implement policies that create climate smart housing opportunities and those help mitigate climate impacts and they also reduce housing costs and inequities. Um, and then most importantly, we wanna make sure that we're prioritizing the voices of underrepresented communities who are often most impacted by climate change. Uh, so that's indigenous communities, Latinx communities, farm worker communities. We have a lot of farm workers up in Sonoma County where we live and they are having to breathe in the fire and smoke with the increase in fires here. So we want to make sure that there are policies in place that are protecting those workers uh, and that the lands are able to serve as nature-based solutions to uh, wildfire and fighting the climate crisis up in Sonoma County. If somebody came to the Bay Area as just a um, a visitor, so to speak. Where would they see your, the, an example of your work? Do they touch and feel it? Give us an example of that. Yeah. Um, so in the South Bay, uh, there's a huge area of open space called Coyote Valley. Um, it's recreational use. So you can go, you know, use the trails, biking, hiking. Um, but this important land is right on the outskirts of San Jose, so Silicon Valley. Uh, during the tech boom, uh, tons of tech companies wanted to build on this land uh, and, of course, have their headquarters based there. So we worked with lots of other nonprofits and organizations to ensure that this land was protected in perpetuity. Um, and what's great about this land is it also is a sponge for flooding. So there have been floods in San Jose 
And this area, which sits right outside of the city, soaks in all of that water. So it's providing a solution to climate disasters and climate hazards uh, and lessening the drought, drought or lessening the flood uh, risk that communities face in this area. Um, so even though tech companies can't build their headquarters there, it's protecting those communities in San Jose. And there's also a ton of farmers and agricultural land that use this area as well. So it's providing food for the Bay Area. So, you know, one piece of land uh, is helping an entire community and also providing food and resources for those communities as well. That's a powerful story. So if we were to peel back the curtain and look in as to like what you do or what your organization does on a giving day or just like these interesting things that we would never even imagine, because a lot of people, you know, can't quite wrap their arms around what nonprofits do. What would you tell us? A couple interesting things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've been around for over 60 years and we really started out as a a nonprofit that was focused on protecting open spaces and agricultural lands. And as a result, we actually have almost 3.3 million acres of the roughly 4.4 million acres of the Bay Area's nine counties are protected open spaces. Um, so that's great. But as climate change uh, intensifies, we really want to direct our land use policy advocacy to ensure um, that these landscapes prove to be resilient places um, in mitigating climate hazards, sort of how I described with the Coyote Valley space, because um, we know that they serve as nature-based solutions to climate change um, from, you know, so soaking up water during floods, providing barriers during wildfires. Um, they serve as a solution in protecting communities. Um, so it's great to see the evolution of Greenbelt Alliance that uh, those lands that we've been able to protect for the past 60 plus years are now a solution for the climate crisis mm -hmm. um, and how our predecessors were benefiting generations after them. And that's really what we hope to do uh, while we have this time on earth is to ensure these lands are protected, but that they're also stewarded and that future generations can enjoy them and that they are benefiting our communities, not just for their recreational purposes, but as a solution to uh, our climate crisis. So in your day in and day out, though, do you ever take like donors out there and come see up close or do you just go out and walk some of the lands or are you usually behind a computer or, you know using the phone like what does your day look like or what interesting little factoid um, might you share yeah we have a outings program um which is run which so i get to go out with supporters and it's also run by ken Lavin, who used to be a uh, National Park Ranger, and he has extent. He's like a, a nature encyclopedia. He has extensive knowledge of the landscape and the history of all these different parts of the Bay Area. So we take uh, supporters out, um, and actually anyone can enjoy these outings. Uh, they're free of charge, um, and our donor community helps support you know the outings that we run. But they're open to the public, um, and we take donors and supporters and the public out on these outings and they get to hear from Ken who has all of this extensive knowledge and can talk about the flora and fauna of the area and really uh, talk about our work in a way that's tangible because you can see how important these landscapes are. Um, and it's it, it really flourished actually during the pandemic uh, when folks were kind of locked inside and it was a way to be outdoors, social distance. Um, and, you know, it's proved, it's proven that getting out and hiking and being outdoors is helpful for our mental well-being as well. That's for sure. So how would you describe an earth giver? Um, I think it's a community of people dedicated to addressing our climate crisis and, 
uh, from volunteering to supporting to, uh, nonprofits to advocacy. I think these are all actions that can be taken to really help in the environmental movement. So in our last question, any favorite resources, movies, books, podcasts that you would suggest anyone take a look at? Yes. Yeah, so um, there's a book out that's called All We Can Save, um, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. My laptop it, is sitting on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great book by Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. It's just essays from women on the, at the forefront of the climate movement and um, highly, highly recommend that, that book. What a great choice. Thank yeah. you for doing that. Yeah. Uh, amazing, amazing women. So, well, gosh, thanks. Thanks so much, Nora, uh, for joining us on this debut of Eco Community Conversations. We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about what uh, Greenbelt Alliance is doing, and we thank you for your important stewardship of a place that a lot of us visit and don't probably think about the work that goes on behind the scenes to uh, protect the space that we love to take our families to or do a business trip or an outing. So, we appreciate all that uh, you do for us. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.